inserted here. Um, so uh, today's uh, lecture, final session, is in our course. I'm going to be going over uh, a couple sets of material that I hope will assist um, the process of building models uh, in whatever framework you use, but particularly in, in any logic. I'll be going over some aspects of debugging, some issues having to do with um, best practices uh, for processes for building models and for actual techniques for, for sort of more nitty gritty technology to use when building models. Um, and then we'll take a look at something called specifications, which are a, a very convenient way of succinctly describing um, uh, describing agents in which we're interested either in collecting statistics in an efficient way or uh, on which we're interested in performing some actions. So we'll look at an example model which makes use of these, uh, st these uh, specifications or predicates as they might be called um, and we'll see how that, that works and links in with some of the issues we introduced last time on subtyping and subclass. Uh, the first thing I want to start, though, with is, is the issue of debugging. And um, I could give uh, several lectures on this topic, um, and I think in many ways that effort would be well placed because um, it's been my experience that people, uh, in whatever model framework they wish to, to use, they spend a fair bit of time getting their models to work. And, and actually a fair bit of time trying to figure out if their model is in fact working or if uh, the phenomena they're seeing are indicative of some underlying flaw in either the design or the implementation of that design. So this issue of debugging, um, figuring out, uh, developing confidence in your model and then figuring out how to, how to uh, identify the sources of, of faults within the model is a big topic and it's a topic of great practical importance in modeling. It's a, it's a topic which is more textured when it comes to agent-based models because of the many moving parts associated with those models. So, um, so would you say that, yeah. that the way you just described it, does yeah. debugging include um, things all the way up to internal validation? Um, that's a good question. I would, um, so in this, in this um, lecture, I'm going to focus on debugging as the process of of tracking down faults, which um, are evidence through failures of one sort or another, and an obvious, uh, an obvious departure of the model from uh, reasonable behavior, um, a crash of the model, uh, a situation where the model is simply stops making progress. Um, the issue of, of uh, validation um, in in it gets into sort of uh, two components, validation and verification of a model. So have you, have you built the right model and have you built that model right? Mm -hmm. And that's, properly speaking, that's outside the scope of this lecture, though the, there'll be some things that I talk about that relate to that. Um, I'm gonna focus predominantly on the issue of, um, have, uh, of how to track down uh, problems. Um, so, um, you know, speaking to, to Chris's question here, um, we, we ask often questions, have we built the right model? Um, and this is, is really the province of, of, of validation. To what degree is this model an in, in, uh, adequate description for the, for the purposes we set forth when, when building this project, to what degree is this model adequate? We can build confidence in the model, we can try to disconfirm it, um, all of this in a way that's specific to model purpose. And often, if we have laps here, it's often because of an oversimplification we've made in the model. We've thought that a certain approximation is adequate or, or our mental model is simply off about how things work. There's been a, uh, there's been a departure of a dynamic hypothesis from, from what's actually taking place. And, and often we learn a lot through our inability to, to, to validate a given model. We have to refine it, and in that process we, we learn a lot. There's a second question, which is um, traditionally given the name of verification. Have we, uh, have we built the intended model right? So we may have intended to build uh, a model that behaves in a, in a 
certain way, or that's structured in a certain way, that um, that uh, capture certain processes um, for our thinking. But we may have we may have intended that, but we put in place mechanisms that actually entailed something different. We made a mistake in typing in a formula. We didn't place the parentheses properly. We um, we simply um, uh, forgot, you know, a, a critical component of it in, in the implementation of our, our plan design. And uh, this is really the province of classic, uh, what goes by the name of testing and quality assurance in software development. Uh, so you have you have some sort of plan, um, and for the moment we view that plan as kind of uh, what we're aiming at, um, and. And then the question is, this artifact that we built, the software, does it really adhere to that plan? Does it, does it really live up to that plan or is there a, a lapse? So a lapse here is typically a model defect of some sort. And we, we use the name bug in a sort of general sense in computer science to denote these things. Um, but it's a defect of, of, of some sort. And in this lecture, we'll be talking predominantly about identifying this sort of some of our previous lectures, such as on calibration, touched on this issue of you built the right model. Here we're, we're dealing with, um, with uh, the issue of how we built the model, we built the model right. And I'm going to use some terms in here in a way uh, that's going to be fairly consistent, um, and I thought I'd, I'd clue you in some of it. So we use the term fault within this, the general field of, of verification of software systems to denote some underlying defect. There's some defect within our, our software, within our implementation that we hypothesize is there. Recognizing whether or not it, there is in fact one is, is, is an interesting question. But if we hypothesize there is an underlying defect, we'll give that the name of a fault. And then we talk about a failure being an obviously visible problem that, that indicates the presence of a fault. So for example, the model crash. It runs for a certain distance, and then it throws an exception and, and dies. Or it, it writes corrupt data to a database, junk data. Um, or it simply won't run. Or it's reporting values that patently impossible given the implications of our, int our intention. So you know, within a system dynamics model, this might involve a population size going negative. You know, or a negative number of people who are recovered from an infection or what have you. But with an agent-based models, um, uh, because stocks are, are typically collections of individuals, they, they can't by their nature be negative within the agent-based model, but you can get other bizarre behaviors. So one of the more famous examples of this with a student project from my normal version of this class back at home is that um, there's a model uh, which you folks have seen a little glimpse of called uh, the chronic wasting disease model. And this is a model of deer moving around and so on. And it's, it's a wonderful model and, and very interesting um, uh, to see how they built that and how they captured the logic. But one persistent problem they had that bedeviled them through a matter of, I think, two months or so of their three month project was that carcasses in the model following death was start getting up and walking. It was kind of a zombie phenomenon where these deer, these zombie deer would wander over the landscape and, and uh, potentially cause havoc with other deer. I'm not sure if they were transmitting infection. I think some of them were. So the be deer do actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that part's okay. That, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so this model um, might have been an adequate model, some sort of zombie-esque Process, zombie-esque process, but it certainly wasn't they, what they had in mind. And they spent a lot of time doing zombie hunting and trying to figure out where these zombies were coming from and how to stop them. Uh, so that's an example of an obvious fault. Um, another example would be if you had a, a model of a lifelong illness or a, an illness you consider lifelong for the sake of the model, such as diabetes, and you know, in your intentions, there should be never anyone that recovers from this illness in the model, but you start seeing people recover from it within the model. Um, or, you know, uh, there's people moving around and they should be blocked, as in the chronic wasting disease model, by 
by the presence of water, like a lake or a river, and in fact, they start walking on the water. Um, that would be an indication that something is off in your model logic. So again, um, we're, we're talking here about model defects, uh, focusing on the issue of have we built the model right. These faults are often the result of uh, oversight or um, logical mistakes. And, um, and here we are um, dealing with failures that often indicate some underlying fault. And we try to chase the fault. Now this is a textured issue when it comes to, to modeling, and particularly I'd say agent-based modeling. Because uh, complex models in general, and I'd include agent-based models, often exhibit surprising emergent properties. In agent-based models, the, the types of properties that we can look to to develop confidence in our model, for example, or to, to understand its dynamics is larger. In a, in a, a typical system dynamics model, for example, a traditional stock and flow model, you're going to be looking at patterns over time that are emerging due to interactions of stocks and flows. Within an agent-based model, you have the additional recourse to patterns on, over space and over, um, over uh, topology, network, in addition to those, uh, uh, to those patterns which occur over time. So in short, um, we have a broader set of patterns by which to try to develop confidence in the model, and a broader set of patterns which can exhibit surprising behavior. And there may be things we consider very implausible, but are naturally implied by the various pieces of our model specification. We came up with an idea of a, you know, a mental model of the situation. We may have implemented it perfectly correctly, and yet we see behavior that departs from our expectations. This is a common experience in modeling. And you have to be very careful to distinguish that from the cases where there's an actual fault in the model. And what I sometimes find myself doing is doing debugging of the sort we'll talk about today, only to discover that actually what I'm seeing is an inadvertent side effect of my um, you know, my logical assumptions. In other words, I did implement it right. It's just it had this unexpected consequence. So um, it may be that the model design rather than the model implementation, um, you know, is, is, is really given rise to these uh, emergent properties. There may be things we consider impossible given our intended model structure that are in fact implied by it. We just didn't realize it. So we're struggling here in the debugging process not only with, with tracking down a real fault, but in fact, in ascertaining whether there is in fact a fault. Or in fact, is this a situation where um, we have implemented the model correctly, there's technically no fault in terms of we implemented the model we sought correctly, but you know, there, there may or may not be an issue with it being the correct model of the external situation. Of course, the most poignant aspects of this come when you see implausible uh, behavior, it's in fact logically implied by a model design, and then you verify some of that behavior is in fact exhibited in the world. That gets really interesting, you know, if actually some of these things are, are surprises in the world. Um, so some surprises here reflect mistakes in implementation. So, you know, I'll give an example here with, with the algebra. Um, some reflect unrealistic aspects of our plan. Um, and had hidden inconsistencies with the world. Others are discoveries about what happens in the world. So we're focusing here <coughs> predominantly on the first of these issues, but it often takes time, and often you go through this process, and you figure out it shakes up to this, or even, even to this final category. Um, you dig down, you dig down, you say, oh, why didn't I think, you know, why didn't I think of that? Of course this is possible given my, my logical assumption. So, uh, we're going to be using this term debugging. Debugging is the process of finding and removing these faults from our program uh, based on observations of failures or aberrant behavior. Um, where aberrant is a relative term that will sometimes smack us back. Um, so I have some comments later in this lecture that are of equal import, I believe, um, in avoid in, in reducing the burden of debugging. 
And these have to do with preventing debugging, the need for debugging in the first place. Preventing faults from making their way into your program. Prevention rather than treatment. But for the sake of this, this particular lecture, we're going to talk about treatment, how to track down uh, a DPEP, what are the steps we can go through. Um, and so we're going to talk about best practices to reduce the debugging load by preventing faults later, later in this particular session. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be talking about assertions, assertions later. In fact, I might come back to that, um, uh, to, to some of these slides. Um, but I'm going to talk today about uh, a basic uh, debugging approach, which works um, very effectively in tracking down problems. And then I'm going to be talking about specific tools that, that are provided by any logic or that can be used with any logic models that allow you to um, more quickly go through this debugging uh, approach, more easily undertake some of the steps here. So the basic debugging approach is to simplify error occurrence as much as possible. That step is arguably the most important. Um, and um, then what you'll do is, is try to um, go and uh, try to locate the fault source. Now this, there's actually only two big high level bullet points here. Locate the fault source is the biggest one, and it's the one that takes the most time. <coughs> Simplifying error occurrence is often of, of equal importance. The time you spend in that first bullet point often pays up the, off in spades because it allows the second bullet point to be undertaken much more efficiently. And in fi fact, this is an issue I find with a lot of my students that they spend inadequate time up in the simplification phase. I want to emphasize, um, emphasize this because I've seen too many students go off the rails uh, because of this and need to be nudged back on. The goal here in the first of these processes is to try to come up with a, an extremely simple, um, directly reproducible and predictable case where the error will occur every time. And often that will require taking a copy of your model, making a, a backup as it were for the sake of debugging alone. So you're not working on your, your, your original sort of model. You're working on a, a simplified version of it and then just ripping out pieces of it until you can get that thing to just show up every time, very predictably. Hopefully, as soon as you press the button, you know, it, it will occur. Um, and often that ends up bleeding into the second stage because what you rip out that eliminates the problem, you should note down very clearly, you know, that, oh, this problem doesn't actually occur if I rip out this thing. Whereas if I rip out all these things, it does occur. So often you find that the two sort of work, work together. Um, Broadly speaking, you're going to gather data context that reproduces the problems. Um, you're going to record what you've done, and then you're going to, you're essentially going to form hypotheses about what might be causing this defect. Um, you're going to try to figure out a strategy that will help you prove or disprove these hypotheses. And you then put that into practice to, to try to check it. And then you're going to use further uh, on the defect until you can pick the fix the now, once you fix the defect, the particular defect here, there's two important things you should do. And I don't want to downplay these. It's really, really important to have these final two steps as an important part of your, of your practice. All too, all too often, software engineers and modelers, they fix a problem, and then they just go back to the normal flow of their modeling. What they should be doing is learning from that defect trying to look for similar errors that may not have shown themselves yet, that lie hidden, that lie latent. And secondly, arguably the most importantly and the highest leverage opportunity, figure out what it is about your process of modeling that let that defect come in to the model in the first place. What is it that allowed you to make this mistake? And it may be inaccurate documentation, it more be maybe poor training, it may be um, poor communication between modelers within the team, 
It may be misunderstanding about how a certain feature of Java works. But all of those give hints as to ways that you could shield yourself by making yourself less vulnerable to future versions of this sort of error. So the most powerful thing you can do often when you find a defect is not just to, fi to fix a defect, but to fix the process. Fix something about that modeling process that allowed that to creep in. So um, think about those final and invest in those final two steps. Um, they're important. They uh, often, after you fix the defect, you're impatient to get started again. But these things may save a lot of time down the road because you, you could fix the defects. OK, so there's some important elements in this debugging process. Arguably, the most important one is, is localizing the problem, simplifying the model and input until you discover the minimum required mechanism to reproduce the problem. So you save away that original model, and then you progressively strip away components of it. And some of the components you strip away, the problem will still exist. Some of the times you strip things away, the problem won't exist. And that's an important clue as to what may be causing the problem. And an important part here is sort of seeing what's executing around the time the problem manifests. Um, and you're going to alternate back and forth between thinking about it and experimenting. Um, you're going to want to observe model state, the kind of situation at points preceding the error. And you're going to compare consistently with previous versions that were working. So sometimes what I do is I, I take a model that that's exhibits the problem, and I'll strip away pieces. And some of the models that I strip away will still exhibit the problem. That's great. Um, those will be intermediate steps. I don't keep all of them. I just keep the, the simplest one. But then there'll be some that do work. And I'll save those often, because that will allow me to kind of progressively compare back, uh, to, back there, uh, to compare back um, you may you may want to insert some code to uh, confirm that certain assumptions are true prior to the error. Um, you may have someone perform a peer review of the model. This is occurring quite a lot right now for your projects. People are bringing their projects to me and saying this doesn't seem to be working, that doesn't seem to be working. And I'll work with them to look over their code a bit. And, and that's an aspect both of peer review and debugging. And sometimes I find things and make suggestions based on that. And then, you know, you're going to be working with some hypotheses about what could be going wrong. Um, so uh, these, are, these are all important uh, elements of this. Now, there's, there's a um, very attractive tool that can be used with any logic that's actually uh, called a, a debugger. Okay? So there's the debugging process, but there are actual tools called debuggers. Now, these debuggers don't go through this process for you automatically. But what they do make it easy to do is to undertake certain components of this process. For example, um, to quickly, more quickly prove or disprove a hypothesis, or more quickly allow you to determine the path of execution, or to observe the model state at points preceding the error. Um, they may make it easier to check certain assumptions. Instead of writing code to do it, you can just do it in the debugger. So we're going to be spending some time here in debugging. But let me tell you this. When I debug any logic models, um, I do sometimes seek recourse to debugger, debugger. But I'd say 90% of the time, I don't use a debugger. I find that actually certain basic mechanisms like uh, printing out some values at suspect points and so on is enough to give to confirm or disconfirm my hypothesis. A debugger is heavy artillery I bring in when there's a uh, uh, the, the other the other prospects for finding it um, are not obvious for finding a problem. Okay, so we talked about debugging as the process of <coughs> locating and fixing faults. Um, uh, we're going to talk about a variety of ways of doing debugging in any logic, um, but these these actually apply. Many of them apply more or less directly to a variety of other frameworks. Whether you're writing your code directly in C for an agent-based model, or whether you're working in other platforms like Repast um, or uh, or Swarm or what have you. So we're going to be talking about using output. Print 
statement. That basically print out, hey, I'm here. This is the current state of things. The most, this is one of the earliest ways of, of debugging. Um, another way is to sort of use model navigation to drill down in the model and kind of crop check what's going on with different pieces of the model visually. This is a tool called Aspect J, which could be used for tracing and logging, which I'm not going to cover, but I'm going to try to create a separate lecture of it. I'll, I'll make available to everyone in the class, but it won't be included in today's discussion. But it can allow you to implement tracing mechanisms across your entire model with, with just a few lines of code, instead of going up and put that code in scattered around your model. There's tools such as Log4j, which are basically logger tools. This is not about Paul Bunyan but it's about um, tools that allow you to, to, to easily uh, output information about what's going on at different levels of granularity and that can be enabled or disabled in a very simple, lightweight ways. So for example, with a config file, as it's called. Uh, by changing something in one file that, that appears next to your project, it will put out more information or less information. It has that potential for putting out all that information uh, through every run of the model, it's just sometimes it's enabled and sometimes it's disabled. And that allows you, when you're debugging something, to enable all the information you want and then to disable it at other times. We're going to go through step by step how you use an external debugger, this debugger Eclipse, to debug your model. We're going to show how you attach to a running any logic model, how you can break into that model to see what it's doing at a given time, how you can set breakpoints in that model to get it to stop at certain points, and how you can report on the values of variables and even change the values of variables with, from within the debugger. In other words, you can take a look at what's going on at different points in the execution. And then I'll talk a little bit, and I have some slides, on actually using a built-in debugger that's provided with more powerful but it's basically the Eclipse debugger that I'm going to show you how you can, how you can leverage directly. Um, okay, so um, the first of these I'm going to talk about is, is manual tracing and reporting here. Um, the pros of this is that there's minimal learning curve. It's flexible. It's really easily targeted. Um, very, very easy to do in a lightweight or thorough way. So it's kind of scalable. The cons are that it requires time-consuming manual markup and some of the markup, inserting print statements and, and taking them out, trace to LN statements, for example. Uh, it can require many builds and simulations to sort of get to the root of the problem. And the console in any logic, this area where information is put out, is of limited capacity. It, I think it only handles a thousand lines or something like that. So you, c you can only use it um, to uh, to output so much information. So there's several ways of doing it. The one we've looked at the most in this class has been this trace LN. We printed out messages to ourselves on the console using trace LN. Um, but it turns out that there's other variants of this that really this has basically the same functionality as this one. Um, although it can be used in some contexts where this, this can't be used for Java <coughs> where any logic um, doesn't know how to do a trace LN this can work. But this is another variant which outputs to what's called the errors, the ERR up there. And that appears in red. Okay, So things, things that you output using this call will appear in red in the console. So they can be highlighted compared to the, to the blue thing. So for example, here is a case where we're using this trace LN um, or print LN system.error, that's the error, so-called error stream. It's a stream for high priority messages such as warnings and errors. And then um, you print something to it. And here it's printing every time someone's cured. It says, um, okay, I, or that I deliver a cure message. I say, okay, I sent a cure message to so-and-so. And because that's printed in the error stream, you have it in red. Meanwhile, um, trace ln or system.out.println will just appear in, in black here. This is very easily deployable. You can scatter these things through your code and you'll see where it's getting to 
and something about the context. Like you could say, okay, who am I sending this message to, et cetera. Um, so the fact that in any logic we can very easily set up buttons and set up sliders and set up um, uh, radio boxes and so on, that those interactive mechanisms, the so-called controls, allow us to custom trigger reporting. So for example, we, if we're debugging a model, we could have a button which when we push it can report some information to us. So we'll report it at a place um, of, of our interest and it can report information of our choosing. Um, or we can use sliders to change things as the model's running that might give us the hint as to where the problem's coming from. Um, so uh, this, this these sort of mechanisms can often be um, a big, uh, big help with this. I don't know if I'll ask you to open this, but um, you're welcome to do so. The ABM model with birth death. You remember the sort of model here, um, and we can dig down. So I'm getting into the second mechanism here, um, uh, using model navigation mechanisms. Okay, um, within this, um, we can go and we can select certain components of the population on which we want to report. In this case, there's 3,080 individuals in the population. And we could drill down to particular individuals. Um, in this case, it shows where they are in the network. It shows the current states that they're in with respect to these two, these two um, states. We can actually go into collections, like children here, and see the children that are associated with this individual. And we can look at various um, various uh, variables for these uh, for these people. For example, here's some of those female um, ethnicity, South Asian, um, and they were born at the dawn of the model or came into existence at the dawn of the model, being just short of their second birthday. Uh, and um, there's some other miscellaneous information around, such as their name. Uh, can anyone tell me? Um, this is something I didn't emphasize earlier, but why is it it actually says female here and says South Asian? Where does that come from? It's because it's a what? Okay, it is a variable, but that's right. It's telling that particular agent that this is female. But how does it know to spell this out in terms of the appropriate that this is female? Why isn't it just zero or one? Or why is this South Asian? Sorry? Yeah, it's an enum. Yeah. And, and this is one of the side effects of enums that I didn't really emphasize when we, when we introduced them. But it's kind of a nice side effect that if you have values that are instead of 1 and 0 being, you know, it, but are instead enums that encode male and female, you can actually see printed out for you sort of the full name of, of the enum, which is, which is nice. Some Boolean variables are also. Um, uh, you know, their values can be shown. For example, this one, this baby here, um, it's, a, it's a young, it's, it's a young kid. It, um, it's, it seems uh, still, though I have to look at the model time to make sure they were born as a young kid, and they were initially infected. So they started in the infected state um, out there. So this is sometimes useful if, if you have some problem going on and you want to scout what may be contributing to it. Um, for example, it may be that a certain person exhibits um, uh, a, an exception at some point, and you rerun the model with the exact same random number seed, and you could stop it or before that, or pause it before that point, and drill down to that person and kind of see what what's this going is on. This is avian birth death. This is avian birth death. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and one of the reasons I created this model was just to kind of showcase some of these uh, some of these features, which are which are useful. So in short, debugging, debugging often involves you know, uh, seeing, the fault, seeing the failure, hypothesizing about the fault, and looking for clues that will help disconfirm or confirm that hypothesis as to what's going on. And so often you're spending a lot of time looking at kind of what's going on just before this error occurs. Like, is there something funky happening with respect to this agent's network or with respect to you know, their, their status. Or, or conversely, if, if you see something, if something triggers the error, let's suppose um, th that the error is triggered later on um, when they exceed a certain age. You know, um, was this person born really old? Or, or did they, in other words, when they first came into existence,
existence were they of that age? Um, that will help you understand where the problem first came in. So you often are going back in time to try to see how early the evidence of the problem was around. And this is a way of doing that. Yeah. Going back to the way we talked about how does deep programming kind of step by step by step. Yeah. Step yeah. How does this, how, do, how does this debugging uh, process mesh with that? Because well, we're supposed to be testing, in this way yeah. I understand it is, each time you add a little bit to the model, you yeah. want to test it to make sure That's it doesn't right. blow up. That's correct. So, yeah, so, so uh, generally speaking, the debugging will be greatly assisted um, by proceeding in an incremental fashion. So the way I'm interpreting your question, Bill, is that um, uh, you're talking here about this idea of incremental delivery. You, you have a model, um, and you don't, you don't try to just set your sights on, on a grand model with all these pieces in it and just go for that and you know that's the first model that you get running. Right. Instead you're producing little little steps towards that and each successive model you try to make sure it's running properly and so on. So when you have a situation like that and, you, and there's an occurrence of a failure, um, the fact that you've produced this incrementally gives a lot of clues as to what might be the cause of the failure because there's only been a certain amount of change since a previous version which worked. Right. Okay. Now, often there's two branching hypotheses that come up at that point. One hypothesis is um, that, that really, um, you know, it, it must be something I did in the past two days because I had this model two days ago that was working and, and now it's not working. And so there's something I did in the past two days, something that logically was touched or logically was um, was affected by what I've done in the past two days that's causing this problem. So that will clue me into a certain set of functionality in the model. I'll, I'll look at a certain place in the model. But the other hypothesis is, well, maybe this problem was there, it was just latent, and I didn't find it previously. And in that case, what you want to do is um, you want to actually go back to that previous version of the model and, and poke around and say, OK, Let's go, let's go see this exact phenomenon. You know, is there any evidence there was any, there was any hidden sort of behavior that would have led to this? And, and maybe it just didn't trigger it because we didn't run the model long enough or whatever. And so often you go back to that earlier version just to be kind of sure that it wasn't hidden there. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But there's another implication of it, which I hope we'll get to later in, in today's session. Um, and that is, uh, Ideally, these um, incremental deliveries should be accompanied by a lot of tests, and the test suites build up over time. Sometimes these are manual tests, sometimes they're automated tests. And those tests basically will rule out a lot of um, basic mistakes that could have occurred earlier. So if you have those tests together with your model, then you're pretty sure, okay, this was pretty thoroughly exercised. And so again, it helps you narrow down your hypotheses. Does that make sense? Um, so here's an example, for example, of collections where the, the contents of this collection are, are displayed. And, and what this is saying is that the children of this individual, OK, so they're no longer a, 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 a spring chicken. Um, uh, so they're somewhere in the order of 65 years old or so. Uh, it's now time 65. They, were at, they came in at, at time 0 with an initial age of, of just short of 2. So they're 65 year olds, and, and they're the proud father, or uh, proud mother of, of uh, five children, um, one of whom has died apparently, and it's no longer the population, and three other kids. And you could use this information if you wanted to, to go look at their kids. So you could look up person number 907 by sort of way up there, where it says person 33, you could sort of go up there and um, I'd have to throw this in. Um, yeah, but it, it, adjust it yeah. to the number you want Yeah, to exactly. Adjust it to the number you want to see. You could type in a new number. Um, uh, and um, OK, I, I said uh, pause model execution and click there. I made it, um, if, if, for those of you who are interested or have this open already, if you click on a given, um, a given um, the instance of, of this, circle, I have an on-click handler which reports information. So I say, you know, this reports, in this case, the information about their children. So my child had a population, uh, you know, a current age of this, of 
person name of that and is currently alive. And you can see the second second of five children is in fact uh, dead. The current age is therefore not, not really meaningful. Uh, they, they had the name person 7091 and because they're no longer in the population, it shows minus one. So this is an example of how um, you can use any logic's interactive mechanisms to report some information, um, custom reporting. Okay, I'm going to be talking now about um, logging, which is uh, the process of recording, uh, <laughs> recording a uh, a um, an archive uh, of events during program execution, and and recording can be made through databases, file, text, console. It can be sent an email to people. Okay, um, it could send actually a log. Um, logging is notable because it, when we think about it, it's typically performed throughout a program or at many places in a program, and it can be performed at a variety of levels of detail. So we might be only interested in very high level understanding about where a program is in, or a model is in its execution. For example, it's finished its initialization, it's now running, it's uh, finished its running, and it's in the final phases of output <coughs> data. Um, or we may be interested in a lot more detail, like it's in the initialization, it's opened this database connection, it's successfully connected with the database, it's downloaded the data on the initial population state, it's closed the database connection, it has now instantiated all the agents, um, the first agent is, is uh, starting their behavior. It could be individual level information on agent behavior, it could be very detailed level. Um, so there's a, there's a framework called log4j, and I have some examples of how you can use it here. What I really want to do is provide you with an update of this model, which actually shows, shows it in use. And so you can, actually, you can actually see how you can integrate it with your models. And I'm going to try to do that, try to do that uh, over, over the coming weeks. So I can't promise if I'll do it by next week. But what's really nifty about this framework is that you can use config files unimaginative, config files to configure, um, uh, go figure. So basically you, you can set up config files that, um, that set the level of desired logging, that tell where to log it to, and um, the format to use to log it. And what this means is without modifying your model, you can tell it, okay, collect more information or collect less information, send this information to this place or to that place. So there's a variety of types of uh, levels of logging, levels of depth of information you can report. And they go from trace to debug to info to warn to error to fatal. So only in the most sort of, uh, the, the most detailed, you're, if you have trace related information, the least detailed you have fatal information only on fatal errors reported. And a given logger can be associated with multiple outputs, so it can output to several places, including email messages and so on. Um, and it can, it can load um, errors up to a server, for example, via HTTP connection. So if you build a model and you have people in Washington, D.C. running your model, when they encounter errors, it could upload prob the problem reports from them to you, which could allow you to better understand what was going on. So Log4j has a so-called logger class. And it's a very straightforward interface um, where you call these methods trace, debug, info, warn, fatal, error um, from different places in your code. So these are like trace LMs, like we used in our code. But the difference is that, first of all, they're marked with a level of severity. And second of all, they're not automatically printed. So which of these is printed depends, what's, uh, depends on what happens to be in your configuration file. And again, without changing your model, and I will emphasize that again, without changing your model, you could, you could change the level of detail at which it's outputting information. Just rerun it, you get more information, rerun it, get less information, not be distracted by this information when you don't need it, but when you need it, it's there for you. Um, this is an example of, of uh, log for j so outputting um, warnings or, or information um, at 
different um, different levels of detail. And, and a config file is this sort of um, this sort of format where basically you could tell it, um, okay, um, uh, what this should this should be doing. It should output things at debug level or higher. So that's basically um, uh, not the most detailed level, but the second most detailed level. And you could tell it to output it to the console, in other words, the screen that you could see in any logic called console. Um, and you could tell it the format you want it to use to, um, to output things. Um, so I won't go through all of this, just be aware that um, these things are flexible. So for example, you could say, okay, I only want to see things at this level or higher of, 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 uh, of uh, detail. And, and a given, um, a given uh, logger can actually output to different, um, different um, uses. So for example, uh, it can go to a file or it could go to the console. It can also be backed up. So before you overwrite the log, it makes a copy of the old log and all that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of nifty. Um, I'm going to try to have an example which shows how that's used uh, soon. Though I'm not going to promise the date by which it's, it'll be available. OK, the thing I wanted, time flies, and we, we have to cover a lot of material. So I wanted to, to spend some time showing how to use the external Eclipse debugger with any logic. I think this is, it's really important to have recourse to a debugger like this. From <coughs> it's really important to have the opportunity to dig into what's going on under the covers in your model when you need it. Again, most cases I rely on print statements and you do, you do great. Print statements and thinking are the main thing. But having that debugger will be helpful from time to time. So um, the debugger here, as I uh, alluded to uh, a week or two ago, is based on Eclipse. This editor we talked about a uh, uh, couple times ago, um, that's one of the most popular software development and we talked about Eclipse in what context? Does anyone remember? When did we talk about Eclipse? When did I show an example of Eclipse use? I was talking about what sort of process. It was the process of begins with a P, ends with a G, with an F in the middle. Does anyone play Hangman anymore? <laughs> um, Yes, it was profiling. Good. Okay, well, I'll get the. Uh, I knew he'd go on the way there. What's that? I knew he'd go on the way there. Yeah. <laughs> he just <laughs> wanted to get the suspense going for the hang, hanged man. Um, yeah, so it's profiling. So we talked about Eclipse for profiling. Um, and you know, you could have looked up here and you would have gotten a good hint. Um, so it provides a lot of tools visualization tools, version controls of models, and subversion repositories. These are all good things. Um, we're going to talk today about the debugger. Okay? So Eclipse can be used to debug any logic models at the Java source code level. What I mean by that is you can look at the detailed code of what is going on in the model and what is taking time. Okay? So um, there's a, there's a, um, a one-time step. Um, that's needed to enable this for for any logic, for a project in any logic in within Eclipse. There's a one-time step for setting it up, and I have some slides in that. For the sake of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna not go into those slides in detail. Um, but I would welcome if anyone here wants to set up Eclipse with this, I'd be glad to work with them to to do this. Basically, in any logic, you have to. Um, to set some properties uh, associated with so-called Java Virtual Machine, and it's associated with a simulation that you want to run. And then Eclipse, you have to create what's called debugging configuration that knows how to connect to um, any logic. Uh, and it's, yes, and I'll show you how you do this. Okay. Um, and so there's a one-time setup that, that requires, you know, about five to 10 minutes to, to go through. Um, and then every time you want to debug, you go to Eclipse. Actually, this is a bit, uh, this is a bit simplified. So start up any logic um, model. You go to Eclipse. You tell it to connect to the any logic model. And then you interrupt it. You can set breakpoints and, and get it to stop where you want it to stop 
cops who can spy on it. Okay? We're going to look at how this is done. So one time setup in any logic involves putting a kind of a, a piece of information under the, um, uh, under the uh, Java virtual machine arguments. And, and you can see uh, also there's some steps to set it up in Eclipse. Um, critically, um, and this is important, for it to know about your, your Java source policy, you can set, so set breakpoints, and so it knows about names of variables, et cetera. You need to point it, you need to set up the so-called debug configuration that can connect to any logic. Um, and, uh, and you need to tell it where your files are the Java files for your project. And that involves pointing it to um, uh, pointing it to the appropriate folders. So the appropriate folder for this version of any logic, it's actually changed from previous version. If you have a user's folder, there's a thing called dot any logic university. And within that there's a thing called workspace. And then you'll look for your project there. When your project is built, it puts the file, the Java file, dot Java file there. A thing called source.generated, and you'll go there and select that as your your uh, source code location. So, in other words, that's that's where it should look for the Java files. Now, once you set it up, you could set breakpoints, see variables, um, and uh, catch exceptions, etc., and and spy on what's going on there. So, um, what I'm going to suggest is that um, we walk through this. Okay, so you can see how this is done, and uh, with your uh, pardon, I am going to to take the pilot seat now, um, and uh, we'll go over to um, to any logic and um, and uh, Eclipse, and we'll see how this is done. Okay, so the first thing that that you're going to do after having gone through this process of setting up any logic to connect on a one-time basis, um, this this whole process that we went through here. Um, uh, I'll show you what that looks like when set up, but basically in any logic. Whoa, okay, hey, get, get out of here. Um, I was running this uh, earlier, and boom, um, kill this thing. Boom, dead. Um, okay, so folks, over here, you'll notice um, there's a thing called debugging session, okay? That's a, that's a type of experiment called debugging session. The reason I have a separate experiment is, first of all, I might want to, I might want to have debugging experiments that have very particular parameter values. They're not your run-of-the-mill parameter values. They're very specific ones that reproduce the error easily or whatever. Extreme cases, for example, are, are, are a good way to do this. Now, if I go to advanced, what you'll actually see is that there's something that says Java machine arguments. And this is this horrible long string to it. See where it says uh, address equals this, da 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 da. Um, and it's, it, it's a horrible thing. You have to do it, implement it once. Now, after that, um, I have this debugging session uh, experiment set up. So I can run this thing. And from an AnyLogic perspective, it's sort of another, um, any, any other type of um, model, except that you'll notice it says listening for transport DT socket at address. So it's waiting there. And it's listening, Look, listening for the hoofbeats on the ground of Eclipse. Okay, now if Eclipse doesn't interact with it, it'll run just fine. Watch this; it stands before us running. See that? In in all its Christmas-like glory. Um, so uh, here it's running, and uh, that's without any interaction from Eclipse. But I'm going to run this with interaction for Eclipse. So I'm going to kill that particular version. I'm going to go back and I'm going to run it again. And I'm going to get it ready for, ready to be connected to Eclipse, okay? So it's all set. It's, it's ready for, for connection from Eclipse. It's standing there, stands before us, ready to serve. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over to Eclipse. Now, I previously had set up Eclipse um, into uh, the appropriate format. I'm going to go back to the normal so-called perspective in Eclipse, which is called um, the Java perspective, okay? Um, this is the sort of perspective that would be most typical when you come in. And I'm going to close these windows just because um, you don't need to. Um, uh, do I want to see? Uh, no, no, I don't want to see that. Okay. Um, just to clean things up. Okay. 
I'm going to go over to the debugged perspective. It actually shows next to here, but uh, I'm going to click it here. Debugged perspective basically gives me easy access to functionality relevant for debugging. This comes with any logic, by the way. You don't have to download anything. Oh, sorry, with Eclipse. You don't have to download anything else. Um, I think it's part of the standard thing with Eclipse, as I recall. Okay, so here we are in, in Eclipse. Now, you'll notice there's a kind of bug up here. And it actually says debug any logic application, but there's a whole set of so-called debugging configurations. And if I click here, I previously set one up using exactly the things that I've described here about adding my source code folders. And I did the sort setup configuration, okay? I've done that already, but I'll show you the evidence that I've done that here. Once I've done that, I have a thing called any logic application that knows how to connect. And there's a pointer to my source code, which is located here for my Eclipse debugging example that I'm running, okay? So once I have that, then I'm in good shape. And I can actually say, okay, I want to debug in any logic application. So it's going off to this port 8321 at which any logic is listening. That's the same port you'll recall where any logic says, I'm waiting for a connection. And actually it's connected. So you'll see here a list of so-called threads. These, these threads are, um, are different things that are running in parallel within the model. Now, right now, there's not a lot of in going on in the model. The model stands before us ready to serve. And so we want to start it now, OK? So uh, before we start it, though, I think what we'll do is we'll set a breakpoint, OK? So um, now that we've connected, we're going to go and open up the Java file, OK? So I'm going to open up a Java file, and I'm opening up the Java file that I normally edit in any logic. Um, so over here in any logic, you remember I could do this thing. I, I showed it to you the past few times. You could say open with Java. Do you remember that? So this particular thing exists somewhere on your disk. And in fact, um, I can't remember in, in this. Um, here's, uh, excuse me. Hey, come on back to person.java. Hey, you stop, stop bothering me with that. Um, Okay, open with Java editor, boom. Okay, here we go, here we go. And, and if, if I went and I looked, um, person.java, um, I guess it doesn't tell me directly where it is, uh, but I could track it down through other things. Here's this person.java, and this is some Java code, okay? And if we looked in here, there was, uh, there was actually a thing called perform birth. You remember that? Remember perform birth? Um, and here's a call to it, but I want actually to go to the perform birth action. And there it is, perform birth, OK? This is this method which we wrote. Remember that? And this calls these methods with very long names, um, establish offspring connections based on mother's connections. OK, so this is in, over in logic. Well, it turns out that that file's on disk. And we can go get it from the appropriate folder, if we just know where to look, in our Eclipse workspace we can go find it. And there's a thing called person.java. And here it is. There's that same file. That's where any logic's looking for it. That's where we can look for it. So now I'm going to go find perform birth. OK? Uh, and there's the call to it. And here it is. There it stands before me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a breakpoint for this. OK? What is a breakpoint? A breakpoint is a point where if the execution of the model in any logic reaches that point, it will stop. But it will not stop and just give up and die. It will stop and allow me to poke around and see what's going on. It will allow me to change, to look at what's the value of the different variables, to dig down into it, to change variable values. It could allow me to perform little experiments to see if it works you know, with this tweak. So I'm going to set a breakpoint. How do I set a breakpoint? Well, I double click over here. And um, if you go and you look at breakpoints here, what you'll see is that when I, when I double click there, it'll actually set a breakpoint. Let me, let me uh, get rid of that right now. That means it's disabled. But if I double click here, um, I could say toggle breakpoint. I was right clicking. And it will then um, have a uh, breakpoint on, and let's see, come on. Um, oh, I guess it got rid of it because it was already there. Toggle breakpoint, OK. Here it is, perform birth, OK? It's, it's this critical area over here that's a bit darker that you have to click on, OK? Um, and alternatively, I could click down here. 
so it breaks when it's only down at this point. I don't have to do it at the beginning of the method. I could do it down here. So in fact, I'm going to get rid of this breakpoint. Um, notice to see the existence of that breakpoint, you have to look up at this breakpoints window. It doesn't actually show a marker. But I'm going to set a breakpoint right here. Toggle breakpoint, OK? Um, and you can see there's a little check mark next to this. So it says line 528 of person. And that's that line. See, it says line 528, OK? So what this is saying is that if this model runs, it's going to stop the very first time you get to this point. Okay? It's going to actually stop and invoke this debugger. It's going to say, hey, debugger, wake up, because I've reached that point. Now, why that's useful, we'll see in a minute. But, but that's what it's going to do. By setting this breakpoint, it's going to stop there. Okay? Okay. So that's all well and good. Um, but we could wait now until the cows come home. And it's not going to hit that breakpoint. Why do I say that? If, if I just walked away from this room and left you to muse. Yeah, OK. So why is it, why is it not going to reach there right now? Because I actually haven't started the model. Remember, I just got it to this place. I just got it to the place. I connected, and I went and I sent my breakpoint. I haven't actually started the model yet for this round. I'm going to actually now start the model. Okay. Okay, now I'm starting the model, and it's starting to run. Now, what we'd expect to happen is, ba-boom! Now it reached that point. Did you see that? Okay, so let's, let, us, um, uh, let us go and kill, kill this model. Boom, dead. Um, and I'm going to restart it, okay? Um, we're going to go through that little exercise again. I'll, uh, this time I'll sort of bring that to the foreground. Okay, so I, I went there. The other thing I had to do was connect to it. So I needed to go, I need to say, hey, go look there, go connect to him, and, and he connects, okay? And I've already set this breakpoint, it remembered that, so I don't have to go reset that break, set it again. Now I go back to this, and this time, take, take a look what's here. In fact, I'm going to close this. You'll see, I'm going to close these things. Um, uh, ooh, uh, it says it's changed. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, uh, just, just do that. Okay, so there's still the breakpoint there. Watch this. I'm going to start running this now, okay? Notice, notice the kind of state of things up here also. Watch this. Those things are going to change. You notice there's something new that sort of got created there. And then, and then you notice it went boom. Um, and then this came into, into being here. So what happened is that it stopped. It created this little window where it shows a green line. That green line shows where it's about to execute. So it just reached this point and hit this breakpoint and has stopped there. You notice there's a thing to, for it to continue up here, uh, this, this little button up here. Um, but you'll notice it has shown me some information here. Does anyone recognize this? Does anyone recognize what this is? You've seen it before, and I cited this lecture as one of being as one of the foremost motivations for introducing this notion. It's a call stack. This is the call stack. So here, execute action of called perform birth. Okay. Um, so this is this is saying perform birth is the currently the topmost thing. So we're in perform birth, and indeed we are. And we're at this point in perform birth. We're just at the mother, their identity, and the and the the offspring, their identity. And notice by hovering over this, ladies and gentlemen, that it actually can give information on these variables. So it can allow me to sort of drill down here. For example, this is an individual who has an ethnicity associated with them. They're South Asian. Okay, that's the one that's giving birth first. Is a South Asian person. Um, there's lots of information here. I don't really know in detail what it is, but their color, for example, um, well, we could know uh, something about its uh, certain properties of it. We know they're, they're a South Asian person. We could look at their name, probably. Person name, I think, was the name of it. Um, um, oops, whoa. 
Well, uh, it's actually easier to do it up through this. So, so here we have a way of sort of digging down. Here's the mother's characteristics here. And we could, we could drill down into that so we could see their initial age was 29. Um, uh, they were not initially infected. The pregnancy status, we can actually look what their, what their state chart characteristics are. They have a certain sex, which here is female, which is good because if they're giving birth, that's desirable. Um, and, uh, and then they have some offspring. Um, the, the offspring here, the variable. So when these two variables are both visible up here, as is the this variable, which actually corresponds to the mother. So I can go and poke around in this information here. Um, in principle, I could even change it. I could even set the offspring to be the mother or something like that. I'll, that would yield undesirable consequences, I think. Um, uh, another thing uh, that could be done is I can single step. So if I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, um, you'll know. Let's go over to the AnyLogic console here. Here's the AnyLogic console. Note, note its current status. The last line here is so and so has died, right? I'm going to single step this. So you see up here it says there's a thing step over, step into. Those have to do with stepping the model forward, okay? So the step over is going to execute this next line. So it just advanced, okay? And now, based on that trace ln, it's printed out this thing, okay? So in short, this has allowed me to kind of go break in and see what's going on. Um, it actually allowed me to, to, to stop here. And similarly, I could either go over this or into this. So here's a call. This is a call to establish offspring connections based on mother's connections. I can actually step into this using this button. And it will step into this and start executing that method. Okay? And and I can actually trace through it, trace through the logic as to what's going on. Okay, who's the next person? Who's being connected to who? And similarly here I could go in and see, okay, who's the offspring that's being connected to the people? And then if I if I go a step further here, Okay, there's this person P to whom they're being connected. Who is that? Well, we could go um, go look here and um, and and try to look for the uh, the identifying characteristics of, of this person. Um, so uh, in short, there's a um, this is the potential for sort of poking around and looking at information and seeing if it makes sense. I can also step return, so I'll step out of the current method. Alternatively, I can step over the current method and just execute it uh, directly. So this is a case where I broke into the model at a certain point. Now, I'm going to show you something else, though, where, where we're going to do something that's of relevance to Jerome's, to an issue Jerome is encountering right now. Okay? So watch this. Um, I've just used this to trace through perform birth. Okay? And as you can see, there's a lot of information there, but generally you can make out some pieces of information that are relevant. Um, and there's going to be a lot that's somewhat mysterious. What I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to create an infinite loop. Okay? This sounds undesirable, but my point is I'm going to see how I can diagnose what's going on where if the model just stops. And specifically, I am going to create an infinite loop in... Um, Maybe I'll do it in offspring location based on mother's connection, okay? I'm going to create a loop which never ends. Um, okay, uh, I'm just going to do while true, um, you know, um, I could even just do it empty. Um, so it'll loop, uh, but to give it a bit of, a bit of, um, a bit of uh, texture, I'm going to have a variable here. And all this is going to do is increment the variable, okay? Um, this code will never stop. So as soon as this is hit, it's just going to sit there forever, unless we intervene in the form of a debugger. Okay? So here I've introduced a kind of pseudo bug, which I want to track down. Wh what is it that's stopping the model? Okay? So I've introduced this code. Remind me to remove this before. You know, before the session is over, right? And in fact, I'll, I'll probably, good practice is to put in something saying, you know, remove, uh, remove 
this after demonstration or something like that. So I could search for, for that. I have a convention of, of signaling to myself in that way. Okay, so uh, first thing we want to do is we want to build this model. Okay, um, just to make sure, yep, it's all fine and good. And I'm going to start up a debugging. Well, first of all, let's, let's run this model, okay? Um, by the way, uh, just, just looking here, this version doesn't actually have their name. And that's why we didn't see a name in their properties. Uh, that obviously would be a good thing to have, this version of the model. Okay, um, so I'm going to run this thing. And uh, actually, I don't need to run debugging session. I can run any session, but that one's just as good as any other. Now, if I run this model now, what do you think will happen? Okay, the first birth, now it will stop, right? So some information printed out, and it said a baby's been born, but then what, what's going on now? Exactly. It's counting. And the time is not advancing here, right? The time is not advancing. So someone could reasonably ask, well, what's, what's happening here? And, and within any logic, for all, for all the many virtues to recommend it, um, you know, it's not obvious what's what's going on. I mean, it's it's just not advancing. I mean, what what could I do? Well, one thing that Jerome and Ollie talked about is, you know, one thing I could do is sort of go insert uh, trace LN statements or print statements, which would basically say, okay, this is being done, this is being done. It's a type of logging, and and I could say, okay, the birth is starting. In fact, I already have a thing here, but I could put a trace LN at the end of the birth and see if it gets through the end of the birth, and I could discover, oh it never actually reaches, for example, this point here. And that would clue me in to maybe where is it reaching. And by digging into it, I could find, okay, it actually stopped in this thing. In other words, by having a trace LN here, if I were, if I were given you know, a bit of time, um, I could do something like this to, to diagnose it. I could go scatter trace LNs through my code. And because this is one of the bigger bigger actions and because it's one of the last actions that occurred here before the model froze up one of the things I'd be tempted to do is put in a trace LN like um, trace LN saying you know the birth uh, is finished or something like that right um, and uh, and then I could run the model and what I would find is that that statement has never reached and that will give me a clue, okay, there's something that's blocking it in performed birth, right? Uh -huh. um, okay, so here you notice this has been bored, but it never says the birth has been finished. So that's a, that would be a clue. But suppose I, suppose I had no clue where it was spending its time. Suppose I had just zero clue where it was spending its time. What could I do? Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time where we roll out the heavy artillery. We roll out any logic. Eclipse, excuse me. <laughs> in, in help of any logic. Okay, so so let us fire up. Gentlemen, start your engines. Um, we're going to fire up our, our debugging version of this. This time it, it maps and it's starting. And in fact, we, sh we should have been more careful here. I, I apologize. Um, well, no, actually, I was going to say oh, we should have, yes, we should have gone over and connected to it. Um, so I'm going to go over and connect to it. Let's kill it. Um, so, so first, run it to that initial screen. Here we go. It stands before us. Now, we'll go over to Eclipse and we'll connect. Right? Any logic application. Okay. Um, so now we've collect, connected to it. Right? We're, we've connected to it. It's they both communicated on this port eight three two one at which the any logic model is also listening. So what is that it, it, it basically Eclipse is, is saying to the Eclipse debugger saying, okay, you can now advance. But, but what is it? Is it no, no, it, it will, yes, it will sometimes interrogate particular values, but not all variables. It, it will, but sometimes like if you want to drill down and find out the value of a certain variable, it may ask, Eclipse may ask any logic, okay, you know, 
um, give me access to this location, it'll pass back that value and stuff like that. But basically it provides access to introspection information, as I understand it, about, about that process. And uh, yes, yes, particular objects. So you No, no, no. You can go drill around. Uh, may maybe we'll. Uh, I'll try to try to try to relate that to something we see here. Okay, so it's staying ready. It hasn't started yet, right? Now, now it's connected. Before I set a breakpoint here, I don't want to set a breakpoint here. Although I could, I could set a breakpoint at, at you know perform birth and trace through what's going on, and I might see it's it's uh, having problems, right? So watch this. Um, one thing I could do, there's no question, I could run the model and it will be running and then it will get to this point of performing the birth and then it's going to reach here and then I could trace through. This is one possibility. If I have a, if I have a clue that there's something is going wrong here, I could do, well, step over and then I could step into this and make sure things are working okay, um, you know, that this is working fine. Um, and and then you know verify okay every one of these is added and then I leave and then I can go into this and in this process I would oh look at that um, okay that's that's uh, that's interesting it actually didn't get the latest uh, Java Java code I'm gonna have to refresh it with the new Java code um, so uh, that that's actually an interesting case so let me, it didn't find the latest version of, of the uh, code there. So let me go open file and go get that, that code here. So persa.java, there it is, uh, persa.java, okay. And then I'll, I'll double click up here and it will put me to the right. Here it is, see, it's going back and forth on this. So this actually would clue me in, okay, yeah, it's doing something dumb. But suppose I didn't have that. Suppose I just wanted to break it and see where it is. So here I trace it through because I had a clue, maybe it was in form birth, but that's an artificial case. Let's suppose I had no clue where it was. Didn't know based on this information with enough specificity to have an educated, really good guess. Let us go now and examine that case. So here we go. So we run this. So I've just examined, you know, uh, uh, really uh, uh, one case where we, um, set the debugger breakpoint and we can trace down. Here we're doing it, we have no clue where it's, it's spending its time. So starting this up, we go connect to it again, connect, boom, okay, it's connected to it. And now we're not gonna set a breakpoint. In fact, let's, let's suppose we disable all breakpoints here. Um, there's, a, there's that breakpoint there, but I don't want it. And I'm going to run, boom. Okay, it's running, okay and then it's gonna freeze. And the question is, where is it, right? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause it. And uh, here's the any logic model execution thread. And there I see it's in this establish offspring location based on mother's location. Let me don't go double click on that. And this is where it's spending its time. This is where it's living right now. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where it will live forever without our intervention. So l let me just retrace what I did, okay? So I started it up, this thing froze, okay? It froze, I don't, I have no clue where it is. We're pretending I have no clue where it is. All I do is, it's Java's, and Eclipse is connected with it, so I could say suspend. And I'm going to go look in these threads. There's many threads that stand before me. But one of them is called any logic model execution thread. I expand that. This gives me a what? What is this thing? What it, it's a call stack. And if I want to find in what method it's currently located, where do I look on the call stack, given how it's presented? It's at, it's at the top of the stack. So I double click here, and it shows me where it's at. So it's burning its time here. And in fact, what's the value of, of i here? Do we dare ask? Um, the value of i is, <laughs> well put, Bill. Uh, it looks like it's somewhere in the order of 1.8 billion. 
that it's gotten to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's right. Maybe that's why it says demon system. <laughs> so so uh, maybe it should be D-I-M-O-N. Um, in any case, um, yeah, so, so here it's, um, here we broke it. So in short, what we did here is we had a fake bug in the model that was causing it to just burn, to make no progress. To figure out where it was spending its time, like what's going on, essentially. I just connected to the model. I didn't bother with setting breakpoints. I connected to it. I started that model up so it was running and it, until it got stuck. It wasn't making any progress. And then I said suspend up here. I, I, I did this, or pause, I guess it's called. Suspend, I guess it's called. And I suspended it. And then I went down to the thread that's called any logic model execution thread. I clicked on the uppermost element of the call stack, which tells me in what method it's currently spending its time. And I saw where it's spending its time. And I could even poke around. And this is to answer Duvall's question. Um, so, so Duvall, this information here, like the value of i, that's the sort of information that <laughs> Eclipse is going to have to fetch from any logic. And the conduit through which it will be fetching it is the so-called uh, port address uh, 8321. It's going to be sending things back and forth, um, which are going to be requesting values and, and requesting values. I think it's going to be values of, uh, of certain places in memory. It's going to ask, like, where is this in memory? I can also look at structured quantities, like offspring what their appearance time is, you know, what their ethnicity is, what their initial age. So yeah. So, so Eclipse is smart enough to know, and, and there's places this information is encoded when you create a dot .class file. So, um, uh, yeah, it's it's running. It's indeed. Um, it's 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 running. Um, it's running main. It's it's running the model. But what you set up is a uh, a conduit of communication between Eclipse on the one hand and, uh, and any logic on the other. And it's bidirectional. So Eclipse can ask for information from any logic and any logic can pass that information back. Um, and, and any logic can tell Eclipse, like watch this. Watch this. When I kill something in Eclipse, uh, sorry, in, in any logic, like if I go to any logic, by the way, actually, so this is an interesting point. While, the, while I've stopped this, it's, it, I can't act, do anything in any logic here. It's like I can't. Oh, excuse me. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, but here I'm not able to, uh, uh, you know, it's in the middle of running. But here I can terminate it. And by terminate it, it will actually terminate the execution over here. And so, so in this case, Eclipse knows to, that it's detached from the, from the file and so that it's no longer able to communicate with it. But uh, it's, sorry? It's really powerful. Yes. Yes, it's really powerful because it allows you to dig in to what's going on in the model. I'll show you one other example here, okay, of, of the sort of information you can get out. So we've seen, we've seen how we can set breakpoints and see what's going on at particular points. We've seen how we can break into, so breakpoints at our code, the code that we created, so the perform birth code. We can set a breakpoint there that, that, that um, breaks and lets a single step through that code, interrogate the values of variables, and even um, change the values of, of, of variables. I'm not mistaken, and I'm, my memory on this is, is a little bit uh, vague. I'm, I'll just um, verify this with the same basic example. So we're going we're gonna to run this. Um, excuse me. I, I screwed up. Screwed up. Um, we have to go through the little ritual. Um, 
what we have to do first is we have to go start this and then we have to do what? After this is started we have to to go set it up so any logic listens using this debugging configuration. So now it's listening, it's connected. Now we can run it and in this case we didn't bother setting any breakpoints or anything. We could have by opening those files but here we're just going to wait till it exhibits dysfunction and then we're going to pause it and then we can go down to the appropriate model execution thread, double click here, get to this point. But another thing I can do is I can evaluate arbitrary expressions here. Um, so let's um, let's see here, right. Um, uh, so this is this is this window shows a couple things. One thing is variables. These are variables that are that are uh, known. Um, another thing is breakpoints, and then expressions can be arbitrary expressions that can be evaluated. Now, in I know when I've used the Eclipse debugger in other contexts, it's actually allowed me to make assignment expressions to these. It looks like yes, add botch expression. So for example, I could. I could evaluate, have it evaluate the expression x plus 10 um, and, uh, you know, print out essentially um, uh, what that, uh, what that uh, value is. Now this is, um, this is exhibiting, um, exhibiting uh, sort of limited, okay, so I just, I just advanced it there, right. Um, so actually this is not um, doing what I expected, but we can go over to here and we could see here's the value of i. And if this is like previous ver versions, I can reset it, for example. So here I've just, so that's significant. I just changed the value of an expression. Why is that relevant? Because it could allow me to do controlled experiments at this point to see if I can eliminate a failure. In other words, by changing the value of an expression or the value of a variable, I could then do a test to see if it fixes a problem down the road. Um, in some debuggers, what you can actually do is to uh, request to to sort of move the, the current location. Um, and uh, in this case, what I can actually get it to do is to force a return. In other words, I can get it to, to jump forward and, and continue running despite that um, despite that uh, problem that it had encountered. So in this case, it actually jumped sort of step forward out of perform birth and now uh, it's, it's re-entered it at another, at another point. Um, so it got stuck again. But one thing you can do here, this force return, is to get it to, to leave the current, uh, the current method. Um, you can also get it to, to, um, to run to the current line, etc. Okay, right. So, um, in any case, uh, this is a very useful uh, sort of method for debugging your code. But what I want to show you is the potential for for getting insight by debugging the code from that any logic is produced. Okay, this is really code that we had written. Let's go now up to another set of code. Um, what you'll find is if you um, start to poke around this, this, this method, uh, or excuse me, this um, file here, which is the file for person, that there's a variety of, of, um, of methods. Uh, for example, that here's a method to get the name of, of various states, and here's a method for enter state. This is significant, folks. I made a slide for this, but I ran out, of, ran out of time. This enter state method, this is used to implement, well, let's see if I can get you to guess. So here's a, a state that you're currently in, and here's your destination state. So what would this correspond to? It could be better named, enter state. But if you have an old state and a new state, it's a transition. This method, ladies and gentlemen, implements the transitions in your, in your class. In other words, the transitions associated in this case with person, because we're in person. So if you wanted to catch people as they undergo the uh, transition from, for example, um, from the pregnant state um, to, uh, or as they enter, say, the pregnant state, here what we see is that it's, 
it's switching. Okay, so this is this is the excuse me. So this boolean is, indicates that whether this is their destination, and this state is the state that they're entering. So if we want to catch them as they enter the pregnant state, we could um, we could set a breakpoint there, and uh, when we do that, uh, we can then run the model uh, forward. So uh, if we go here and we say toggle breakpoint, we'll see that there's a breakpoint now in line 282. Um, and, uh, and now we could run the model forward. Uh, and we'll find that uh, in this case, it's, it's uh, uh, someone's giving birth before that. So we're going to have to sort of attend to that. And, and nudge it along, get this uh, to go out of there, force return, um, because we've left that in there. But um, uh, this should be allow us to stop at that um, that state when we enter that uh, pregnant state. So I'm going to, again, stop it there, um, go here, get it to return. I should probably just go and eliminate that. Um, that bug so it doesn't distract us. Um, maybe I'll do that and then, then we'll go back and exhibit this, uh, or examine this case of, of blocking this um, or of get intercepting the, the entrance to the pregnant state. Pardon me while I just go back and remove that bug that we had artificially introduced. So here's the performed birth and, and here's the established offspring location. So I I'm going to remove this per my comments and now I will recompile it. And now I will fire it up again, and that won't distract us now. Okay, so go connect. Uh, we're connecting to it. We should really load this uh, this uh, person .java in. Um, yes, I want to update that. Good. Okay. So we should be able to. You notice this breakpoint is still uh, still enabled. Line 282 of person.java. Let's go down and make sure that's still at the same place. So enter state, um, and here we are. Uh, and that is again the entrance to the pregnant state is again at line 282. Good. Okay. So um, we come back and now start this. Um, so you start the this thing running. And when someone enters the pregnant state, we will um, we'll go and we'll block here. So in other words, we'll, we'll stop here. And so this is any logic code. We can now intercept when a transition fires. And we can trace when that transition fires what is, what is going on, for example, um, uh, what, other, what other things are, are happening. So. Um, this is a, uh, a bit of an ability to, to intercept uh, transitions within our model. Any transition is going to be going through this enter, enter state. Um, any transition that's into a, a state is going to go through this enter state method. And so here we've broken into any logics generated code in a way that allows us to kind of spy on when transitions are occurring. And we might not even want to break uh, in a consistent way. We could sort of maybe change something and restart and then break on it again, et cetera. So in short, um, the uh, Eclipse debugger allows us to spy on what's going on within a model. It allows us to chain what's going on within that execution of the model and to experiment and to try to track down where problems are coming from to try to make sure the what the state is before a certain point, et cetera. So um, the Eclipse debugger is heavy artillery. It's not something you roll out easily, but it stands there with, uh, with any logic to help to resolve underlying performance issues, particularly for the sort of infinite loop that Jerome is currently experiencing. Okay, um, So I just uh, went through this. It's documented in the slides how to set breakpoints, um, et cetera. Um, I should note that I because I want to get onto other material here, um, there's a variety of other features um, that you can undertake here. Um, I guess one thing to note is breakpoints are retained from one session to another. Um, another thing you could do is catch exceptions. <laughs> so if you want, for example, to, to, to trigger the debugger deliberately at a certain point in your code, 
you could throw an exception and catch it in Eclipse. So if you go and you look in Eclipse, um, in addition to setting breakpoints at defined points in the code, one thing you could do is set breakpoints associated with exceptions of various sorts. And what that mean is, that means is if your code throws an exception, it will stop there at that point it's being thrown. So for example, you could catch a, a, a null pointer exception or a runtime exception, uh, various types of, of exceptional conditions. And uh, that is actually enabled uh, up here, and I never remember exactly uh, exactly where it is. I think here it is, uh, add Java exception breakpoint. So you can add a breakpoint if a certain condition exception is thrown. So when you have an exception being thrown from your, from your model, you could catch it in Eclipse, and then you can poke around and see what the values of variables are around that time, okay? Um, so that's just a little bit of the Eclipse debugger. Um, it's, a, it's a very handy tool when you really need it. So any questions about that before I just uh, talk about um, uh, the issue of the built-in debugger with... Yeah, yeah, these will all be posted. So, you, and I've verified them with this version of AntiLogic, so you should be able to apply them more or less immediately with your models. Um, okay, so um, any logic, uh, higher any logic versions, more expensive any logic versions in short, support a built-in debugger. Okay. Um, uh, I use the Eclipse external Eclipse debugger. Uh, I use the university version. Um, so. It's actually gone through a bunch of changes. It used to be called Advanced. Now it's called University. Um, but that's, that's the version I use. There's also professional version, which is a lot more pricey. Um, if I got a big grant, um, you know, uh, a, a giant grant, I might go for the professional version for some of the extra features, such as GIS integration, such as um, uh, the, the built-in debugger, um, some additional features. But for the most part, I find um, uh, the the other versions, particularly if you know your way around, you can you can actually get pretty far with them. Uh, a lot of cor corporations do, for example. Um, their universities may use it, but there's also something called a research version, which is kind of a mid-tier uh, version that costs in the order of thousands of dollars per seat. Oh, there's tons of corporations that actually use it. It's, it's fairly popular out there. Um, and so, you know, companies that are interested in doing simulations of anything from, um, you know, operation, construction site operations, if, if they're selling software for that sort of thing, to companies doing uh, um, consulting on uh, passenger flow for subways, um, uh, companies doing simulations of traffic flow through cities. Um, uh, these sort of models that you see here are, are quite general in their application. Um, and any logic capacity to tie together the discrete event, the system dynamics, stock and flow in the, in the agent base is very powerful. And so it, it, you know, you'll find quite a lot of companies are actually customers. And any logic uh, does a pretty good job supporting them. So anyway, uh, any logic built in debugger, it's basically the same sort of debugger we've seen here. One thing you can do that's very nice is you could set, here you could set breakpoints in your code from within any logic. What we've just seen is that you can set breakpoints from your code by opening the Java files for it from within an external Eclipse debugger. But here, in the code for a function, for example, you can set a breakpoint within that, that, that code directly. Um, when you hit the breakpoint, it will stop there. Notice it does stop, ladies and gentlemen at main.java, so it shows it to you in the context of the full Java file, but you can set it in the little snippets of, of code. Um, and you can, as just as we've seen here, it's basically the same debugger, there's breakpoints, um, there's a call stacks that, that you can inspect, you can inspect um, variables here in the same sort of way exactly that we've been exploring them within the external Eclipse debugger. And for composite variables like arrays, I didn't show this, in, in what we were just going through. But with arrays, you can expand arrays like this, and it will show you all the elements of the array, what's at each index of the array. Um, and that's very useful. And, and you can, in fact, um, uh, you know, uh, use here, you can um, 
override the values of variables, et cetera. Um, okay, um, so essentially the same debugger, but a little bit easier to use because it's it's tied in um, with any logic more more tightly. Okay, so those are issues with uh, debugging. Um, I've tried to put an overview of approaches from 